Hey, assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, this is Dr. Sabah Khan and I welcome everyone to this unique event celebrating the Muslim women in the greater Chicago area brought to you by the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago, the Illinois Muslim Chamber of Commerce and the Arab American Business and the Professional Association. We are so happy so you could join us and we want to thank you for taking our part of your weekend to celebrate this incredible women on our panel today. We are so honored and blessed to be surrounded by so many women doing extraordinary work. In this month of March, the Women's History Month, we wanted to inspire our community by highlighting some Chicago area Muslim women who are excelling in business, in places of worship, in nonprofit organizations, and in the workplace. We believe it is so important to connect and celebrate these women and their contributions and to showcase the diversity of our Muslim community. So we hope that you walk away from this conference motivated to take on new challenges in your own wor workplace and your own life. So today we will focus on Muslim women and businesses. And these are women who have been chosen not only because of their expertise, but also because of the positive impact they are each making in their own communities. Mashallah, Chicago is a hub for entrepreneurs and it was not easy task narrowing it down to just nine women we have chosen for today. Today's moderator who will introduce you to the women we are highlighting is also extremely accomplished. So we are so lucky to have her on board as a moderator and I wanna thank her. Her name is Ms. Zubina Khan and she's the vice president of business banking at BMO Harris Bank. Zubina has been in the financial services industry for 15 years and has specialized in business and commercial banking with a concentration on lending for small businesses. She works closely with the minority owned businesses and specializes in SBA, PPP lending, payroll and cash management services, subhanAllah. She's passionate about the work she does and takes pride in helping business owners sustain, sustain profitability in the community she serves. Mashallah, such an accomplishment. Ms. Zubina, the stage is all yours and I welcome you here. And if you can please take on and take on this event. Jazakallah khair. Asalaamu Alaikum, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to interview such powerful Muslim women leaders right here with us today. Um, I am extremely excited to get started with introducing our panelists. First, I want to start with Anissa Mutana, started, uh, who started working in her parents' machine shop at the age of 11. She's a hands-on leader with extensive experience in almost every aspect of production machining environment. In 1993, Anissa left her family's business to assume ownership and control of Pioneer Services, which was a small struggling company at that point. Now the same company serves multiple industries needing Swiss machine precious parts. Anissa attributes this success to building a team that embraces continuous improvement, diversity, and leading edge technology. She's won several awards, including Manufacturing Institute's Award 2019 NABO Woman Business Owner of the Year, Crane's 2019 and 2020 Notable Woman in Manufacturing, and SWE Woman Engineers You Should Know. Anissa speaks at keynote events where she delivers her message of hard work. She makes time for faith, friends, family, including her four grandchildren. We are the light, who are the light of her world. Moving on to Rahila Anwar, who is the president and CEO of Group 360 Consulting and was named a notable 2021 leader in HR by Crane's Chicago business. She opened Northbrook Consultancy in 2020, offering career transition services to employers. She speaks to women leadership at Fortune 1000 companies and is also the board member of Winnetka Community House and the director of Winnetka Northfield Library District. 
Next, we have Dr. Constance Shabazz, who is the president and owner of Health Serve Resources. She has over 40 years of experience in healthcare field. Dr. Shabazz is an experienced clinical administrator, health management consultant, and CMO coach and mentor, who has worked in a number of community health cares. She has her master's in public health, business administration, and public administration. Next, we have Yvonne Maffe, who is the founder of Recipe Developer, who is the founder, recipe developer, photographer, food stylist, writer, and publisher of My Halal Kitchen. She has been featured on TV and in print media, such as CBC Religion, The New York Times, and CNN. She was the official guest of Obama's White House Eat Celebration and the first professional ambassador for the promotion of halal cuisine and products in the U.S. and abroad. And then next we have Imani Mohammed, founder of Imani's Original Bean Pies and Fine Foods. <clears throat> Her mission, she started her company in 2005. Her mission is to provide healthy alternatives to dessert. She puts her heart and most importantly, her family into her pies. If you haven't tried it, you must go and try some. Her pies were voted the best in Chicago by Chicago Tribune reporter, Louisa Shao. Next, we have our very own Ikra Azar a former um, Prince journalist turned digital marketer and entrepreneur, founder of a digital marketing agency and Muslim women entrepreneurs. She remembers her youth editing the message and doing pro bono graphic designs with work with MCC youth and other non-for-profit organization. She now brings her branding expertise, creative direction and social media strategies to the communication department of CIOGC. Hera Umer, scrumptious by Hera, started in 2011. She started off as a passion that turned into a hobby and five years later expanded into a friendly neighborhood bakery known by the community today. While she originally began baking from her mother's kitchen, her loyal client base allowed her to expand to an official storefront. She won several awards, including Best Bakery of Lombard two years in a row. She's also been featured in print and also on television on the Fox News. Sylvia Morales is the founder and of Refine Accounting Services and tax firm. After spending more than a decade in corporate America where she obtained a controller position at a public traded global manufacturing company, she decided to take her experience and pave her own way as an entrepreneur. Additionally, her passion to serve the community and her Muslim faith led her to be a founding member of Ojala Foundation, Latino Muslims of Chicago, where she serves as a council member and director of financial affairs. Furthermore, she is the financial advisor of Shy Care, a non-for-profit dedicated to serving Chicago's homeless community. Well, now that I made the introduction, I would like to turn it over to you guys to talk a little bit about your business and how you got started. We can start with Anissa. Sure. So my beginnings was at the age of 11. I was on my parents' shop floor. Uh, I learned everything from cleaning out tanks, taking out the garbage, and payables, receivables, payroll, and running a machine. Uh, my dad, at the age of 13, I felt as, a, as, a, as if it was a privilege back then and still believe uh, manufacturing and being a maker is uh, very profound. And um, as the only girl, uh, even within my family who uh, believed in me and in my, you know, participating, I was always, you know, the princess, the, you know, always daddy's little girl. And no matter what I did, um, I didn't 
feel that people were taking me seriously within the company employees, even customers, and sometimes even truck drivers. And so I realized that really to really pave the way and to make a name for myself, I had to leave my dad's company. And at age 23, back in 1993, and for those of you that are doing the math, I'm 51 years old. (laughs) Uh, And so alhamdulillah, like that really, I didn't know what to expect. And I know that many times uh, people were saying that you're going to fail. What are you doing? You have a good income. You're leaving a comfort, uh, you're, you're a comfortable actually company at that point, because from age 11, when my parents opened up the machine shop, by the time I left at 23, the company was successful. And so for me to leave that um, was really risky. But looking back at it, I, I, I hindsight is 2020. But even during that time, I knew that I was going to, I used to joke and say, I'll learn how to say, do you want fries with that uh, (laughs) before going back? Because I knew, I knew that, you know, it was too uh, stressful on my family. It was too stressful on my dad. And I didn't want to argue or have that type of dynamic uh, relationship. So my uncle uh, has been in my ear and he wanted to partner up. And I kept saying, no, no, no. But then I said, okay, I have two conditions. Number one, um, I want you to be the silent partner. And number two, I'll do all the work. And he was like, how is that? (laughs) Where's the, where's the not win for me? Um, But I didn't want the same dynamics as I had at my dad's company, because I knew if my uncle was going to be charged, even if we were at the same level, it would still be the industry is very male dominated. So it would be very difficult for people to take me seriously, knowing that there's a man in charge as well. And so he agreed and 28 years later, alhamdulillah, I'm very proud of transforming my company from old manufacturing to new, very high tech, modern machining. We, you know, we serve a variety of industries, including aerospace and electrical vehicles. And it's been hard, I, I'm not gonna lie. It's, it's extremely challenging. Even today, after 28 years, uh, there's always challenges, but there's also the, the uh, reward of, you know, accomplishment and knowing that I'm paving the way, knowing that I'm breaking barriers, knowing that, you know, people are following my lead. And it's, um, and I'm very grateful for my parents who paved the way for me and particularly not just my father, uh, but my mother who came to this country in 1969 and worked in a dirty, grimy machine shop when yeah. sexual harassment and racism wasn't anything anyone was addressing back then. So Alhamdulillah, that's a little bit about where I am and where, how I got there. Oh, Alhamdulillah, you've come a long way, but if you didn't take the chance, you wouldn't be here. Yeah, Alhamdulillah, thank you. Next, Rahila, do you wanna talk a little bit about your business and how you got started? Sure. Um, I'm gonna build on some of the things that Anissa said. I'm so struck by um, her, the support of her family and um, the passion that you demonstrated. So you really inspired me. Um, my journey um, is not very complicated. I um, came to the industry that I currently lead in a decade ago. And human capital is a um, space that is not particularly diverse. Interestingly, it's diverse in terms of women. There's a high percentage of women constituents at all levels of leadership in human capital, um, but not minority women. It isn't a typical um, career path for either first generation um, or women who haven't served as leaders in other parts of the organization, in which we know from um, all of the data and research, um, the percentage of women minorities in other leadership roles is really small. So a decade ago, I came to be an individual contributor um, in was head of strategy, but really I didn't have a large team um, for that. And I was just good at it. I loved it. Um, The idea of helping people transition had always been something I did even when I was a financial services executive, helping women reenter the workforce, um, helping people who were in active transition who from our community still thought that there was some stigma. I would challenge everyone on this call that after 2008, Everyone knows someone who was in active transition. And so um, in some ways, that's one of the best things that happened to our industry because it removed the stigma that anyone has done anything wrong. 
Uh, and then uh, over the last decade, clients that followed me to another organization said, why are you not doing this? You have such a specific way that you take care of people and we're so loyal to you. And so in October, I launched my own firm. We have 39 clients as of today, six Fortune 500 companies, and we help them transition people in the most caring way. Um, what we're doing is taking the skills that they have and helping them find a new journey. And I tell people I have the job of my dreams and it is a dream come true to help people. And I don't mean for money. We only accept compensation from companies. Everyone else who reaches out, we help at no um, fee to them ever. And so um, my story is very much one of family support too. I've been married for 30 years. And my husband, who's sort of this traditional, everyone who knows him knows, sort of this traditional first-generation Pakistani immigrant doctor, True to, true to the way you would expect, said to me, I believe in anything that you want to do, just do it, don't talk about it. And so um, I definitely had his support. I think my children are kind of neutral on their support, honestly. Um, they are, and I love Anissa that you admitted how old you are. I think I'm, I'm 53, so now I've broken the glass for everyone else. Um, I'm not sure my children are 100% supportive, I'm being upfront. And my mother and father are the most incredible people in the world. My dad is 89, he was a PhD student when I was born. And he said to all, me and both of my sisters, we want you to know that working is something that we want you to do. I started my first job when I was 11, uh, babysitting every Friday and Saturday night um, for a Muslim couple that lived in the neighborhood. And then um, that was on Saturdays, on Fridays I babysat for a couple that had one son and they went out every Friday. It was actually quite incredible as a role model for um, a marriage, but so that's what I did. And it got me out of, I didn't get into any trouble because when you babysit every Friday and Saturday, trust me, you, you don't get into any trouble at all. Um, so that's my journey. Wow, that's amazing. Sometimes you just need that one person to give you the push and tell you you're able to do it. Agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And next we're moving over to Dr. Shabazz. Yes, I sound like him. Um, I call myself a serial entrepreneur. Um, when my husband and I married, uh, my late husband and I married, uh, we, we both had this passion for you know, selling things. And, and we, so we started doing that. Uh, and it was, it was nice because I felt like I had freedom over you know, my income. I mean, I was working, but also it gave me the opportunity to, to um, have my own income, build my own business. So over the years, we did a number of other things. Uh, my husband was an imam and he was a, a Islamic scholar and, and was a writer. So he, his passion for books actually turned into us uh, opening up a bookstore on the South side mm -hmm. of Chicago. And then from there, we ended up, um, transforming that to a literary services uh, company, which we still have, and we help authors to get their works into print. Um, so how did, how did we get to health resources consultants? Well, along the way, you know, I'm a physician and I, I worked with a number of community health centers, um, both in Alabama and in Illinois. And I always had this passion of being sure that people had affordable health care. And I had the opportunity uh, of, to, of working with a number of community health centers in the Chicago area. And I ended up going, uh, working as a consultant for the federal government. One thing I saw as I, I had the opportunity to visit over 300 health centers around the country was that I saw that there were a lot of needs that they had, you know, in terms of support, clinical executive uh, level support. And so that came, to, you know, I thought about this. I said, well, wait a minute, if the feds aren't doing it, this it, to me, that's called opportunity. And so back in 2009, I started Health Resources Consultants. Um, we work with health centers all over the country to uh, help to bring them in compliance with their requirements for the federal government, but also we provide them all kinds of technical assistance uh, in the recent years, I've worked with uh, Inner City Muslim Action Network, Iman, and I was able to help them to get their first uh, 
what we call 330 grant. And so it, it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to use the, all the expertise that I gain working in, for someone else and using it for myself. And so it's an exciting uh, and we hope that particularly now with COVID-19 that we're actually gonna get busier. We're actually trying to get more Muslim led health centers. Um, there are about 70 or so around the country that provide free services to consider becoming a federally qualified healthcare Center. So again, another opportunity. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you so much. And again, it goes to show you it's like a pattern where you take your experience and turn it into your own entrepreneurship. So thank you very much. And um, next we have Yvonne. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. All your stories are so inspiring and uh, I admire all of you. Um, well, mine is, uh, let's see, where do I start? <laughs> I came to Chicago in 2002 uh, after getting married and after being a very new Muslim, I was only Muslim maybe, you know, half a year. Um, and prior to that, I had a background in international development and teaching Spanish and I had certification to teach English. So when I got to Chicago, I ended up uh, teaching English to uh, an all girls school um, and uh, then that's how I really got to know the Muslim community. And I loved teaching, it was wonderful. I loved learning you know, about the community there and it was a new Muslim, so I really needed that support. But in the back of my mind, my dream had always been to be a travel and food writer. And um, before I was Muslim, I lived in San Francisco and that kind of fed that dream because after work I would, I would hustle at going to restaurants and getting out in the foodie world way before Instagram and way before hustle was a thing. But I started freelancing um, at that time. So I would you know, go to restaurants and you know, give people advice about where to go. And I, they were, there were websites that were available at that time. To, to send out your queries. And so I, I was doing it on the side. But after I became Muslim, I kind of had a conflict of, you know, is that something I could do? Um, you know, it was just a mental thing, but, you know, I kind of just dove myself into the community and also learning more about my, my, my religion and my new family and all of that. So, but that thing was just burning inside of me. And then 2008 hit recession. Um, and I was a little burned out from teaching, to be honest. Um, and the thing that, that kept gnawing at me was that, you know, this food and writing thing, and I knew travel was really difficult. I wasn't going to be able to do that. And a student of mine told me about blogging. Mm -hmm. And uh, because my mind was already fresh, you know, looking for opportunities all the time in the space of writing and where you could get published. And back before blogging, you had to query, you know, uh, magazine authors or editors, you had to query newspapers, you know, to get something out there. But with a blog, I said, Oh, my God, I can just publish myself, I don't have to wait for anybody. Um, but what to write about. When I was in the schools, I realized that, you know, this whole thing about halal food was something that, you know, the kids were really interested in different cuisines. I mean, it was a mostly Indo-Pakistani uh, group of kids and families, and um, they were interested in lots of different cuisine. And here was I, you know, from outside culturally. And I'm like, wow, you know, there's sort of a bridge here. And my family, who's not Muslim, uh, really didn't understand what halal was at all. You know, there was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of tension every time I went back home about what to eat. I'm from an Italian family on one side and Puerto Rican on the other. So it was really difficult to, you know, kind of just sit at the table and figure out what we were eating. <laughs> so I decided that that would be my niche. Everyone told me, don't do it, stick to Mediterranean food or, you know, something else. And I said, well, this is the truth, true to me. You know, uh, I know, I know how to write. I know about food. And this halal thing is a space that no one is talking about. And so I learned everything I could about blogging, coding, marketing, pulling my hair out, you know, just figuring it out. I, I, I stopped teaching and I focused only on this website, sat on my couch pretty much every single day for two years, bootstrapping it, learned everything I could, lost the whole entire site at one point <laughs> wow. and had to come back to it, um, reaching out for help. Found a great web design, a web, web developer who helped me get it back. And, you know, certain things that could just sort of happen, but bit by bit, um, brought it all back and stronger. Um, 
and that was a time when, you know, you could have paid for ads, but I never did. Everything was organic and it was just bootstrapping it and sitting at that couch and, you know, developing a recipe in the kitchen, taking the photos, putting it out there. And that time, you know, was Twitter had just started. Instagram wasn't around. Facebook was, was my main thing. And I said, wow, this is free advertising. I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity. And, and then I started work, reaching out to Chicago area food companies uh, because a lot, I'll be honest with you, people who saw what I was doing just said, they patted me on the head. Oh, that's nice. What a cute hobby you have. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know what? I have to just prove myself. You know, there's no sense in talking. I, if I take this seriously as a business, then I need to look at my profit and my loss. And so then what I, I started, when I started reaching out to food companies, they didn't know what to do with me. They're like, well, what do you, how do you want to work together? And so I came up with ideas. Well, I'll take your chicken. I'll come up with some recipes and then, you know, we can do business that way. I'll advertise for you in this authentic way, you know, show people how to use your products. Um, And so that just snowballed in one, from one company to the next, to the next, and then, you know, traffic on the website spiked. And then I said, I have to write a book, but nobody, nobody would, would publish me. They said, what is this halal thing? And I'm like, but you, the world needs to know what halal is. You know, I was really passionate about that normalizing halal. And so nobody was going to publish me. So I figured out how to publish a book myself. I found, I went to the local copy shop, uh, asked the printer, like, do you know any designers? He gave me the best designer I still use today. And I published my first book called Summer Ramadan Cooking. It was very niche. And everybody said, why are you doing that? It's Ramadan. Who care? You know, people aren't going to, and people know how to cook in Ramadan. Like they don't need that. But I said, well, there's nothing out there. So it, a lot of times it was just me trying to put something out there that wasn't there that I liked, that I wanted to share, that I wanted to show. And I said, well, if people don't like it, then we'll figure that out. But I, I felt this gnawing you know, need to do that. And so we put that book out there. It's still, uh, it's still on, uh, online on Amazon, print on demand. It's awesome. Uh, and then after that, I got a publisher in Chicago who came to me. I got an agent and a publisher and I did a second book. And from there, things just rolled and rolled and rolled. And that book is now in the White House because that book, you know, really just was a stepping stone for more and more work and other things to do. And so I'm just happy that Halal got the attention it did. And if I was any part of that, then, you know, I can sort of rest easy. But now there's, you know, more things to do and more things to do globally. So now I'm trying to get into Turkey and working with the Turkish government on, you know, spreading halal like worldwide, you know, so there's, there's some exciting things. And I think step by step, I've just sort of said, I've had a big vision, but um, I feel like the work is never done, but I just have so much fun with it. (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing. It goes to show you when you come in and you're trying to find the answers, there's not much resources there. And then you actually took that and put more resources out there for anyone else that's looking to learn. So thank you. Welcome. And um, next we'll move on to Imani. Yes, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, okay. Um, So Imani's original bean pies started out as a homeschool project in my then I had a home daycare and I was homeschooling my children along with the, maybe a couple other children that were in my daycare. And so it started out as a project, um, studying the Navy bean, um, how it got its name, um, its health benefits, things like that. At that time, it was my daughter, was the oldest, and she was about seven, I believe. And um, the, the parents, everyone loved the, the product that the pie, because we did a few things. We talked about the Navy bean, we made bean soup, bean salad, and bean pie. <laughs> so the bean soup, of course, was something they were used to. And then the pie was our first time making it together. So the parents, they encouraged us to like keep making it and maybe we could sell it for a fundraiser and we did. And from there, I, I saw that it was something that I could use to show our youth that we could make and manufacture our own products. And fast forward, I think we started around 05, 06. Um, we began selling it as fundraisers and then it grew from there. Um, those youth are now mostly um, teens, uh, college students and adults, young adults. 
and they basically helped to grow Imani's original bean pies. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. That's all good. Getting everyone involved to take part. Right. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and many still are and many are able to come back with knowledge that they're learning and help us to, you know, grow e even further. And then we have some that are entrepreneurs themselves. We have artists, hairstylists, uh, you name it. <laughs> so I'm really proud of what was able to grow out of this. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Ikra, we have her next. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Ikra and um, I, I basically identify with so many of you. It's this kind of an event that made me want to start Slate Collective. I wanted that kind of support day in, day out. Um, but where did I get started? I mean, if you ask my parents, it's they had always had an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, as young as 17, I was launching my own national magazine. I was a Muslim youth literary magazine and we took it to ISNA. Um, then I realized that it's not magazine publishing that I didn't know it was business. So over the next couple of years, um, I was working as a print journalist in Canada. Um, when that started to die down and I was you know, pregnant with my son, I realized I wanted to do something that gave me some location freedom and some time freedom and uh, discovered digital marketing where before I used to think that was just a male dominated sleazy space. I saw it really changing. A lot of my peers and colleagues were going into that and um, I sort of just stumbled upon SEO. Um, you know, uh, one of my YouTube videos really took off when I didn't even know what I wanted to talk about. Um, so I was like, what is this? And I really loved it. And uh, it was my first few gigs actually where I saw the power of women coming together, women influencers who had helped advertise certain like, you know, apps uh, that I was working on. And I realized that this could be a community and Toronto was such a great space for, you know, the Muslim women entrepreneurs. Um, I, I never seen a community like that before. And I wanted to bring everyone together. So we started doing some events, some classes. I'd never really seen a community like that because we it wasn't just a, a nonprofit. We were teaching business, we were teaching marketing, connecting women to each other to collaborate and you know grow their sales and things like that. And then we started getting requests from other cities to do the same thing. So it's, it's now like a global um, online community. Um, obviously with COVID, we have become definitely more online. But uh, previous to COVID, we were doing physical events in different cities, uh, bringing, you know, women with untraditional career paths or women who are entrepreneurs, um, you know, and some of you here also, you know, we've met because of Slate Collective. Um, so I've, you know, been really, really uh, grateful that that just happened. And I consider myself a serial entrepreneur because um, once I started that, I started to have more problems that I wanted to find solutions to. Um, so while I was building that community, I would, you know, sometimes want to leave my son someplace and I'm a single mom. So it was really hard to find that support the way that I needed it. And I built a Muslim uh, caregiver site, kind of like the care.com for Muslim families. Um, right now it's, you know, currently for pandemic, we've made it free, but it's a subscription based site. Um, and, you know, we've uh, been doing trials with the Toronto and Chicago audiences, but it's supposed to be something that all, you know, in North America can use. Um, and we've actually been uh, receiving some interest from investors, but I'm just not ready for that yet. Um, and, you know, every part of it has been problem after problem. But I think as entrepreneurs, we kind of share this drive and this passion where, you know, we just know that needs to exist and it doesn't necessarily phase us. So, um, you know, always uh, getting questions about how did you, you know, manage to do more, more than one of these brands at once or like, you know, how'd you get this, you know, out there? How'd you, you know, end up doing this thing? And it's honestly like, when you put your mind to whatever you're trying to bring out, you want to bring that vision out, you find those, you know, resources, you find those solutions. So I was never someone who was going to build a tech site. I never knew I was going to be a Muslim woman in marketing or business. I literally thought I was going to be a novelist and I majored in creative writing, but here I am now. So uh, it's so great to be in your company and learning from you. Um, especially women of all, you know, ages and experiences here. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And you're absolutely right. Once you put your mind to something, you can absolutely do it. Um, next, we have Hera. Assalamualaikum, everyone. I forgot I had to speak as well because I've been enjoying everyone's story so far. 
there's a few familiar faces here. Miss Maffei from Halal Kitchen was my English teacher. <laughs> so, so happy to see her here. And, um, and we, we baked a you know, cake I, together too. Yeah, I just remember that we did that Facebook um, live session before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so how I got, yeah, good to see you as well here. I also know Ikra from her Slay like, Collective, uh, one of her events from there. So it's really nice to like, you know, hear everyone's stories and how they got into this and, you know, um, how they're like where they are at this point. Um, so I own a bakery in Lombard. It's called Scrumptious by Hera. Um, so my story is not as crazy as everyone else's, <laughs> but basically the way that I got into it, I always wanted um, like a creative outlet. Like I was in search of a creative outlet. I couldn't draw, I couldn't write, I couldn't, you know, do majority of the creative things that were out there. And I tried my hand at everything ever since I was little. I remember I would always be like trying new things all the time. So cake decorating also just happened to be one of those things that I was like, oh, well, let me, you know, let me try my hand at cake decorating. Um, and it started off where I had seen like an advertisement in Hobby Lobby for a Wilton class that was like 20, 50% off. And I was like, oh, it's only 20 bucks. I dragged my sister. I was like, you know, let's go try out this class because I need something to do, right? So I, and it was like the dead of winter. So in Chicago land, we, we know how our winters are. So I don't know why I decided I'm gonna do this, but I took my sister. We did like, you know, the four classes that they offered. And I was like, I realized like, I can't draw. I can't like, I can't draw a stick figure to save my life but I can make crazy cakes. I was like, this is awesome. So that just kind of, when I found that outlet that, you know, that was awesome for me. Like that was, I was like, whoa, like there's something I can do in this world. Um, but at that point it was not meant to be turned into a business and everything that it is right now. Um, the way I got into that was for the two years, I just, you know, practiced, make cakes for everyone, uh, my family, friends, all that kind of stuff. And I just got better and better at it. And my family would always tell me, they're like, you know, just start it, start it, start it. My brother and sister, they named my business and they were like, we're going to make you a page and you're going to post all your cakes. And I was like, it's not something I want to do, but okay. And I just, you know, kept going with it. I know I wanted to keep making cakes and obviously they're expensive to make. So you can't just keep making them for free for everyone. Um, in 2013, I had gone through a divorce while having a child at the same time. So I'm a single mom. Um, and that's what led into the business where I was like, you know, what is something I had never worked a job in a day in my life, you know, daddy's girl, like Anissa, <laughs> but Anissa was so hardworking. Um, so super daddy's girl. I was like, oh, okay. What, you know, what am I supposed to do now? I also have a child. Um, so at that point I was like, you know, I, I don't want to rely on my parents or anyone else, like financially, I want to be financially independent, but I also want to be here for my son. Like I want to raise him. I want to be in his life. Um, so that's when I decided, you know, how about I take this passion and turn it into a business. And the funny thing here is when I was in school, I wanted to become a teacher and my dad would always be like, you're just going to waste your time going to college for, you know, teaching. You're going to be a, like a business person. Cause we're like, we're like Pakistanis and we're Maimans specifically in Pakistanis and they're known for being business people. So he's like, you know, business runs in your blood. And, you know, my dad telling me that at that time, I was like, okay, dad, you know, whatever. But I didn't know, you know, 10 years later, I'm going to be a businesswoman. So <laughs> um, that's just how it started. It started from my parents' basement, uh, their kitchen, their basement. And then it just kept growing from there. You know, like I would take orders, I would work at night spend time with my son in the daytime and eventually I realized I was like you know this is I'm outgrowing the basement I'm outgrowing the kitchen and I didn't want to um like you know take only a specific amount of orders or things like that like I didn't want it to be limited so around the three-year mark in 2016 is when I decided I was like you know let's just turn this let's, let's just see where it goes from here let's make it bigger that's when I decided I'm gonna open a storefront um and alhamdulillah you know we I took undertook that um, and we opened the storefront. I've been here for almost five years now in Lombard and, you know, won multiple awards, featured in multiple places, done a crazy amount of work, um, and, you know, survived the pandemic so far. So Alhamdulillah. Um, but yeah, that's how I got to where I am right now. Amazing. See, it's just a hobby that you take it and you work on it and turn it into something else. I actually did my son's yeah. birthday cake last year. Oh, which one was it? 
the McLaren car cake. The oh, blue one. Well, <laughs> yes. What kind of later? I don't remember. Uh, right now. <laughs> All right, next we have um, <laughs> Sophia. Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Sylvia Morales, and I first off want to thank everybody here for, for giving me this opportunity to join and be a part of such an amazing group of women. I'm hearing everybody's stories, and it's just resonating with, with my passion, right? Like um, like it was yeah. mentioned, it tends to be a passion that, that we have and an idea, and then we just, you know, make the commitment, open a business, and <laughs> pray for the best. So a little bit of background on, on me. Yep, so I, um, I moved to the Chicagoland area after graduating from university in 2010. So I have a degree in accounting and supply chain management and typical you know, career, joined corporate America. Alhamdulillah, I had a pretty successful uh, corporate career. I dedicated to... Um, to just my job. Uh, I, I don't have much family, or I didn't have at the time family, any family in the Chicagoland area. I became Muslim shortly after coming to Chicago um, in the reading room with Sister Mary Ali uh, near MCC, if anybody's familiar. So that was also in, in 2010. So because, you know, um, obviously like practicing my faith, learning about Islam, I didn't want to be out and hanging out with friends, doing things that you, you know, probably shouldn't be doing. So it gave me an opportunity to really focus on my career. And I was pretty dedicated. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, like with the grace of Allah, I, I climbed the corporate ladder. Um, accounting manager specifically started focusing on cost accounting in the manufacturing world. So all of you manufacturing sisters out there, I, I became pretty dominant with um, analyzing cost analysis, understanding profitability, and eventually became a controller for a publicly traded company. And during that decade of, of seeing my corporate career, I realized that I just have such a passion for numbers and understanding profitability and really helping explain that to, to mm -hmm. others. And um, many people know that accountants tend to be pretty risk averse. So we don't like to take, you know, that risk. And so I realized that I could do something that I love, um, which is finances and explaining finances to others and helping small businesses. So they take the risk, they open the business and I help them make sure that they're understanding profitability that they're understanding like what product segment is most profitable as well as making sure that that they um, are keeping good books. Cause I, I would say that that's probably one of the areas where a small business can fail from the beginning is if they do not maintain accurate records to the point where they can then go to their accountant, to their tax accountant and, and get everything filed. I mean, that's one of the things that I stress always is you want to be up to par with, with IRS regulations and you want to make sure that you understand your industry. So um, the, the truth is I'm currently in transition. So I actually still have a full-time corporate job. And I, I started this business because it's been about five years that I've been telling my husband, like, I really wanna do this. I wanna open up a tax and accounting business and help small businesses. But um, three kids and you know, five years later, <laughs> I, finally, um, I finally made the plunge. So I, I, um, it's, it's been a, a difficult journey as far as time commitment but I feel like it's something that's definitely worth it, especially if it's gonna get me into the area of focusing on helping small businesses and, and doing what I love, which is again, finances. And you know, I, I wanted to focus on, um, at first I was a little like, okay, how do I do this? And what really helped me was I started volunteering for two organizations, which was mentioned in my bio and that just opened up so many doors it, as far as giving me the confidence. Like, you know, I, I really do know 
finances and I really do know accounting and and I just took that for granted. Um, like there there are people who who this isn't their passion. This isn't what they want. This isn't what they want to do. They want to be making cakes or they want to be running a journal. They don't want to be dealing with the finances. So um, so yeah, I mean I I I. I made the commitment. I officially, and it, uh, the kind of person that I am, like I research everything, like, okay, what do I need to do for a state of Illinois? What do I need to do for the IRS? So it took me a few months and, and I, I finally opened up my business and here we are. So Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It goes to show you it's never too late to start with your passion. And if you have the knowledge, let's get out there and try to help as many people as we can. Thank you so much. Now that we've learned so much about how you get started and what your passion is, we're going to dive into some questions. So I will start with Anissa. Um, in your career so far, what has been the most significant milestone for you? <laughs> Do we have two hours? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, first and foremost, I have to say I'm completely honored to be on this panel, listening to the stories and just knowing that, you know, there are women out there representing our faith and doing it so well and are breaking barriers and becoming successful and willing to share their stories. So kudos to all of the ladies. I hope to connect with you after this. Um, mashallah. So I would say, um, as far as challenges, there's so many. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, in manufacturing, if I were an old white male, mm -hmm. I could list 20. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so in the beginning, I wasn't very um, willing to network, not necessarily because of the lack of confidence, but really the time. Mm -hmm. And so from 1993 to around 2011, I didn't do any networking. I was just focused on my four, in between my four walls until I lost 90% of my business. Mm -hmm. And um, this got me in the Wall Street Journal and on cranes, my, this story, manufacturing surviving, you know, 9-11, surviving the recession. And then 2012, 90% of my business literally within six months goes away. And uh, I learned marketing, I learned, not that I didn't know it before, but I was like full force getting out of my comfort zone, going to every event that had manufacturing in it and walking in a room and seeing that, okay, I'm the only woman. I'm the only brown person. I'm obviously the only mm -hmm. And so, and I'm divorced and in manufacturing, it's very conservative. So most people are married and bring their wives, their trophy wives, where I'm like, I have no trophy wife. <laughs> I, have no, I have no hubby. <laughs> so really just walking into those type of environments in the beginning, you know, the sense of belonging, I had to like, tell myself, Anissa, if you want to learn, you know, you're going to get out of your comfort zone. And that was not just going to events, but going on YouTube and Google and researching precision machining. And literally I transformed my company from that old manufacturing, the typical parts that we made uh -huh. are fairly simple into extremely complex parts that go into Tesla vehicles, aerospace, medical devices. And so that transition was extremely challenging and getting my team to buy into that transition because like many of us, um, especially I think that we take the responsibility as the business owner to take care of our team. And I did not want to send anyone home. Mm -hmm. Literally my receivables, I'm alhamdulillah debt free. I've never, you know, even when investing in equipment and investing my buildings paid for. So when that happened, the benefits of being a Muslim and knowing that I don't want the debt, I don't want the rebat, helped me, subhanAllah, because my debt was like zero. And then my receivables kept going lower and lower. And my payables kept going higher and higher. And that was challenging. And for me, that was just really 
laser focused in and being becoming successful and through the networking is where I built my relationships very strong relationships where I joined several prestigious boards where I you know I had people coming to me asking me to speak at events because they heard my story at an event you know at a, 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 a lunch event that I'm sitting at a table with and I and I and it really goes back to I was taking notes actually um, one of the sisters was mentioning like how she didn't know Sylvia, she didn't know she brought so much value. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was an expert in my field until I was around others realizing that I am an expert in my field. And then I became more confident during that network and during building that network. And I, and I would suggest, you know, that's a really important, um, observation for me. And, uh, I always tell people out there that want to become successful and how do you build your confidence? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, a lot of advice I can give, but one of many is building the network inside and outside of your uh, workplace and building those relationships and make it a win-win. Don't make it just that you're needy and asking a bunch of questions, but also bring value and that will build your confidence and mm -hmm. that will broaden your network and that network will then become your plan B, your plan C, your plan. And this is obviously the land of opportunity. The more people that you know, the more people that respect you, the more that they're going to want you on their team. So even if you're not an entrepreneur and you have a, a job and you become, you know, mm -hmm. very frustrated in that job, that's the best way of finding other options. Mm -hmm. So I, I was trying to answer your question and yeah. then also kind of, um, you know, make my uh, resonate. story resonate yeah. with others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have another question for you, actually. What role has your faith played in the success of your business? Every part of my success is because of my faith. And everyone knows that. And I have two Muslims working for me out of, you know, I've had 50 to up to 100 people working for me at one point. But my faith is extremely important. And I'll give you an example. Um, we have core values and those core values. Anyone that works for my company, my suppliers, my customers have to be aligned to my core values. I fired customers because they were not aligned. And those core values come from my faith. And I always say in every business plan, Raval Walden should be in it. So make sure that what you're doing at home yep. is also very important that if you think you're gonna find success outside your home and you have a, a, a mother crying, wishing she heard your voice, that's not going to bring you success. So make sure that is you're aligned with core values, mm -hmm. whatever that is, it doesn't have to be, you know, even if you're not Muslim, you should have some core values, but especially in our deen, we know what's um, wajib, we know what's required of us and mm -hmm. being an example of our faith, you don't have to be a poster child, but you have to lead by example. Yes. And our faith has to be that foundation. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, well said. Thank you. Uh, Rahila, I have a question for you. Um, if you could go back and do something differently, what would it be? Um, I think Anissa hit the nail on the head. If I could go back um, to my first 18 years, which were all spent at one financial services company, I would have spent as much time developing an external network as I did in internal network. Mm -hmm. I retired when I was 40 and I probably knew after 18 years, I don't know, 8,000 of the 12,000 people on a first name basis. I had gone to a lot of roles, but that's where I focused a lot of my um, energy in addition to client relationships. But those were kind of secondary to being an internal person. I was head of M&A um, globally when I retired. In what Anissa said couldn't resonate more with me. Um, I intentionally started out um, a decade ago to have client relationships that were um, deep, that were complex. Um, and I, like uh, many of the people I think on this call, 
I don't go out at night. Honestly, I go to bed at 845. So like, it's hard to go out at night. Um, number two, I don't drink. I, you're, you'll never see me in a bar hanging out with people. But I know every single leader in this city that likes having a 7 a.m. breakfast. And I, until the pandemic, um, four to five days a week had a 7 a.m. breakfast. And I'll meet them wherever they are. You know, if you live in Lincolnshire or you live in Burr Ridge, I know every breakfast place that you're going to go to. So it's finding a way to add value based on your own, Anissa, to use your um, words, core values and core beliefs. I don't believe um, that there is one um, path, but if there was one thing that I would have done differently, it's starting out earlier with having as extensive a focus on networking as I've had over the last decade. Absolutely, it's all about advertising yourself and getting out there. Yeah. And um, I'm gonna ask you the same question. What role has your faith played in the success of your business? Um, so I would never be able to have accomplished what I have without um, having been raised in a very, very faithful, um, I would say um, last night when I went over to my dad, my dad almost always is praying Maghrib when I walk in the door. Um, and to my, my mother was not as faithful. My father was the one who never, ever on Sundays, we weren't allowed to miss Sunday school. I grew up going to MCC. Um, then when my husband and I got married, we joined IFN up north. And then when we had children, um, our children were the same way. They were never allowed to miss um, um, school at ICC where they went to Sunday school. But people have heard me speak. Um, I, I don't know um, if this is boring, but for the first 15 years of my career, I never missed fasting, but I would go to lunches and cut up the meal and move it around. And once in 15 years, someone noticed once. Wow. And that was a lot of lunches, guys, because people are self-absorbed and they're busy. Mm -hmm. And someone called me after a lunch I had been at and he said, you're Muslim, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, I noticed that you didn't eat one bite and he had served Northern in the Middle East. And so he was very familiar um, with just, you know, fasting and the time of the year. And he still had friends who were there. So it was after that um, he said, why don't you just tell people? And then after that, my assistant would tell people and say, Rahila is fasting. She's still going to come to every meal. Actually, it's sort of strange. Watching people eat is sort of motivational when you're fasting. <laughs> I know that's strange. but um, And so it transformed how I, I conveyed my faith here in the small town that I live in. And Sabina, we were talking earlier. Everyone knows when my husband and I are fasting. They're they're cheering us on just before our before dinner walk. They're saying how many more days are left. It's just a certain amount of confidence mm -hmm. from being able to message that I really didn't have when I was a young professional and now feel much stronger about. Um, in fact, a year and a half ago, we hosted a dinner for my top 20 clients. Every single person showed up. It was on a Friday night. I mean, I can invite them to anything and, and trust me, 20 people, aren't, you know, aren't 20 couples aren't going to show up. Every single one came to our home. And that was joyous. So inshallah, those days will come again, but um, so it's a really important part of my life. Absolutely. Yes. I feel like faith is everything. <laughs> That's how you lead to success. Um, I'm going to move on to Dr. Shabazz. Um, I would say, uh, let's see over here. What financial advice would you give to new business owners just starting off? Mm -hmm. uh, get the sister who's the accountant. I mean, seriously, <laughs> you, you want to make sure that, you, and most businesses have problems in that they're undercapitalized, mm -hmm. you know, and so in this day and time, you know, um, because your know, markets have been kind of skittish and if you're new out there in, in a business, it, it, it may be hard for you to generate, you know, the, the capital, you know, you might not be able to get the sizable loan that you need. And so I would say, uh, you know, I, I did a, 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 a report that was doing some uh, research on, you know, what is it that most small business 
people do to capitalize their business. And a fair number of them borrow from family members uh, that they may uh, pull from their uh, retirement, uh, you know. And so you have to make sure though that you still can take care of your, your everyday, you know, um, uh, expenses. So you wanna make sure that you uh, go after any funding. I know uh, someone, I'm not sure if you, you know, SBA funding, uh, anything that's gonna help you to cushion because there are going to be those air times in which you mm -hmm. are, are really struggling. Um, we had um, a catastrophic situation where we had opened up this bookstore and I was in the, the in between uh, getting my so-called dream job after graduate school. And in the course of less than a week, we had a fire and my husband was in a life-threatening car accident. You know, so we had to um, abruptly close down our store. But alhamdulillah, you know, you talk about faith, you know, we had faith in Allah that this, this, this business was bigger than us. It was a passion that we had and it was a way of us um, actually fulfilling what we saw as our life purpose and also it gave back to the community. So we had to be real creative, you know, because we had to close down for three three months. And I'm sure the people who were going through COVID, it, you know, understand that kind of thing. But you really need to have your ducks in a row. Unfortunately, we had uh, enough funds, you know, that we had in terms of savings and things like that. But having that clear plan, even if you never use that plan, Mm -hmm. is really critical. And that's why I, I wasn't joking about getting with the sister and saying what, what happens when we have those, those good days, those good periods of time, and, the, and how do we prepare for contingencies? Because it's better to have that plan and never need it than to need it and never have. Okay, so mm -hmm. this is, you know, this would be my advice to someone. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And I'm actually going to move over to the accountant in the group. So Sylvia, we want to get your perspective of this question as well. Want to see with your experience, what you have to say about this versus someone that's been in business for 40 years and be great takeaways for everyone. So um, what do you think is most important financial management best practice for anyone? Yeah, so I, I definitely agree with, with the sister as far as understanding your revenue stream, understanding the cost that it's going to take to build up, and then truly having like a one-year plan, two-year plan. Like you really want to plan it out at least for the first few years. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to be bringing money in from? How are you going to be marketing? And have a budget. I mean, even in corporate America, budget is every year. We revamp our budget. We look at our budget. And not only does a budget help you understand where you plan to be at the end of the year, but it also holds you accountable to, okay, how much marketing money have I allocated? How much IT money have I allocated? So, um, that would definitely be my advice. And, and one thing would be to try to do this as soon as possible. Don't let this be an after fact, you know, like don't let this be, you know, oh, well, I'm, I opened up my brick and mortar and I don't know how I'm going to pay rent. You know, that's the kind of stress that we, I would advise anybody to stay out of because when you have a passion to do whatever it is that you're doing, you don't want to be worrying about the finances and how are you going to pay rent. You want to worry about uh, servicing your customers and providing a great experience. So making sure that you do that upfront, making sure that you do that before. This should be one of the startup thoughts, mm -hmm. not you know a year, two years later, because it, it could fail. Absolutely. And it's so much easier to get funding when you least want it versus when you need it the most. So it's best to pre-plan ahead of time and budget, budget, budget. Yes. Great. Um, I do have another question to you. Our obligations include time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, time for ourselves, time for our relationships. With running a uh, demand in running a, uh, I would say maintaining, sorry, let's start this all over. <laughs> Given the demand of running your own business, how do you maintain your obligations along with your relationships and having a successful business? So again, it all comes down to planning. So it's all about prioritizing and um, setting 
setting these strict guidelines upon yourself, upon your family. So now I'm speaking from like a revert perspective. So I did become Muslim when I was about 22, 23 years old. So um, one of the hardest things is explaining to my family my requirements, my obligations, first of all, my decision. And it's amazing because at that time, my, my mother, she she would mention how out of all my siblings, and I'm one of three, um, I'm probably the one that disappointed her the most because of that decision. But it's amazing because I stayed strict. I stayed, you know, like, okay, mom. And, and obviously Islam teaches us to respect our parents, Muslim and non-Muslim, right? Like that requirement is to, is to our parents in general. Um, so I would just be respectful. Like I understand, but this is, this is, my, my decision, it's my life. And, and this is something that, that I choose for my life. And subhanAllah, after the, like over the past 10 years, she has seen the positive impact that Islam has had on my life. And even when she comes visit now, and, and let's say pre-pandemic, like we're gonna go here or go there, run these errands. She asks, okay, are you gonna have to pray while we're out? Do you have what you need? Like, like just, it, it has, it, my choice has impacted her to where she's now considerate of the way that I live my life. And it all has to do with just being consistent. And I would say the same thing has to fall into our business. So do not let your day-to-day -day activities um, come before our responsibility to our prayer, our responsibility to our faith, just in general, meaning like the business that we're doing, the businesses that we're going into, the clients that we're servicing. If we always like have Islam first and foremost, then Allah will take care of the rest. And that's the kind of mentality that we should always have. Alhamdulillah. Okay, I have my next question for Ivan. Have you, as a business owner, turned to any organizations or other women-owned businesses for support or collaboration? Yes, I have. Um, and when I couldn't find it, I, I formed my own mastermind group of women. Um, let, me, let me go back for, uh, to answer your question. So when I first started, um, I realized like, as Muslim women, we have some unique needs. Wow. And I'm, I'm always a resourceful, resourceful person looking for, you know, information when I can't, when I need to know something, you know, I'm very curious. Um, and so when I started my business, I was looking for answers to, you know, how do you start an LLC? Is an LLC better than a S core? You know, how do I do this and how do I get started? So the first organization I looked to was SCORE. Um, and that's a group of retired uh, business people, or some of them are not retired, but it's, it's a group of volunteer business people and every city has them and they're funded by the government. So it's, an, it's a wonderful organization that um, has a pool of people in your region. And uh, basically you, you, you ask for what you need, whether it's tax advice or um, how to grow your business and, you know, and they find the right people, they match you up in pre COVID, you, you could have meetings in person. So I did that at the very beginning and sat down and there were three gentlemen who had all been retired businessmen. And I laid out all of my stuff and I said, please help me. You know, I, I don't have any business background. I have no one in my family is in business or and nobody could help me. And so they basically saw what I was doing and they said, well, do you think this is a viable idea? You know, and, and they asked me, well, what's your vision? And I had, I, had put in, I had put my vision on a big board and you know, how I wanted my business to grow. And they basically guided me over months and months of time, you know, um, and I would meet with them and check in with them and you know, uh, you know, where, where I had progressed and so on and so forth. And they were a great deal of support. So um, not, I'm not in Chicago at the moment. So I'm in San Diego and, I, and I, as soon as I got here, I reached out to score again and said, you know, hey, this is where I am at this point and, you know, mm -hmm. what can I do here? But at, to that end, I think, I know for, for women and Muslim women in particular, I really felt that there, there weren't enough uh, resources for our specific needs, whether it's, you know, interest-free loans, um, you know, the workarounds in Ramadan and, you know, we have, we have very specific, I think, um, you know, family obligations or prayer, you know, things like that. Like, I really wanted a group of women who, who I could go to that would really understand and help me and we could kind of network with each other. So I picked about nine or 10 women that I trusted with my life and said, hey, would you guys want to be part of a mastermind group? 
And uh, this is a, you know, they're all in Chicago. And we used to meet once a month and basically just talk about, you know, I would say, this is my entire problem, you know, and there would be tears and there would be, you know, frustrations and, you know, we would focus on one person's issue every month and then everybody would chime in and help. And subhanAllah, that group has grown and people have moved on, but everybody progressed into something, you know, wow. we all feel like a very, you know, big part of that. We still meet on Google Meet, but I think, um, you know, and I think this group of women is amazing and I hope to connect with all of you because I think we all have so much in common that we can help each other with, but that power of, you know, of, of not just, uh, being all business all the time, but, but addressing like our emotional needs. I went through a divorce. I, I it was, it was difficult. I was down. I was thinking to give everything up. And if I didn't have those women who really understood my particular situation, um, I think I, I don't know if I would have bounced back, you know, the way I did. Um, and in other words, there's always, you know, difficulties. And I think like those emotional uh, aspects of our life are, they do affect our business and they're, you know, I think that's just one thing I would suggest if, if anybody can like find a mentor or mm -hmm. a mastermind group, or if anybody wants to join mine, I mean, there's things like that. I think that we can, you know, be creative about, cause there are, there are different needs. I think we have than, than a lot of other women. Absolutely. And I think we should all take advantage of all these wonderful leaders that we have over here sharing yeah. their input. Let's try to exchange contact and get yes. in touch with each other and collaborate and see what outcome we can get out of it. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. Totally. Mm -hmm. And my next question is for Imani. In response to COVID-19, what have you done to stay engaged with your customers? Oh, thank you. Well, we utilize social media largely for a lot of our advertisement and our ability to stay connected. Another thing that I do is I allow my customers to contact us personally. And so with that, with them having the ability to do that, um, as we have made, had to make certain changes and maneuvers throughout this pandemic, many of our customers have been able to contact me and it's funny because they'll go in the stores and ask questions and they'll say well I don't know and the customers will say well I'm gonna call her <laughs> <laughs> and so so that's that's pretty much what we did I'm, I'm kind of more of a hands-on type of person and um so that's that's basically it social media uh use, utilizing this technology like we're doing now Perfect. So you're basically um, allowing your customers to reach out to you. You have the most welcoming persona for your customers. Um, I do have another question for you. What would you say your faith has played? What kind of role has your faith played in your business? <laughs> so pretty much everything because of what the business is. Mine is original bean pies. Uh -huh. um, and bean pies being a staple in the uh, Muslim communities for years, even before I was even born. So um, naturally, um, because of what my business is, I get a lot of questions. Um, our company was featured at the Chicago History Museum. I think this is the last month that America Medina is running. So there's been a lot of you know positive things like that, interviews um, and phone calls that I receive because of my faith and because of what I do. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanna say what the lady said prior to, to what I'm talking about is, is so key. Um, whatever it is that you do, it should be, I used to say that when raising my children, like wherever I go, my children should be able to go. Um, our business should be the same way. It, it, it should be a part of our life, whatever our moral and ethics are, our morals and ethics are. We should be able to take it into our business and everything that we do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, my next question is for Hera. How did you market your business and which tactics have been successful for you? Mm -hmm. Um, marketing my business, mostly, I feel like I grew organically from the beginning. It was all word of mouth, you know, 99% of my clientele comes in and they say, you know, this person told me about you or that person told me about you. 
Um, and I feel like initially I didn't really need to like go out there and like search for clientele myself or like really put myself out there, which when it hit me that I actually have to do that, I was like, oh, so this is also a part of business. You know what I mean? <laughs> Where you have to actually go out and get the orders <laughs> because I'm not, like from the beginning, it was just, you know, this person told me that person told me and they, they would just come and come to me. So I never really had to make so much of an effort. Um, but when I did have to start putting in that effort, I was like, okay, what, what do we do? You know? So um, social media has been a huge one. Mm-hmm. I also um outside of social media like I mean like I'll advertise it on social media we do a lot of like different types of like events so like when I first started my business I really wanted to um like help other people also get their like you know foot in the door or um you know get their business off the ground so in the beginning we used to host events at our shop where we would feature small businesses of different types and you know a lot of those went out went on to open their own storefronts and expand in other ways so um that was really cool um and I feel like all these things come into marketing right like all these different things that you do to set yourself apart it's like people do take note of it the other thing is we'll do like events like last year we did a lot of um even with COVID we had our Harry Potter day event (laughs) where we did like specific themed desserts for that day um and you know people came through so it's like connecting with clientele on different levels um through different people so like when I won that like Lombard Best Baker of Lombard award that was one of like their requirements I guess I said um you know they noticed that we did different t- like different types of marketing that really set us apart from other bakeries in the area um but yeah connecting with people social media marketing and just offering like different things different like I we ran like a cupcake campaign last year and I just offer all these different types of things that would bring in different various groups of people. Of course, you have to kind of think outside the box and use different yeah. tactics to get customers in through the door. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, my next question is for Ikra. Actually, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, how did you market your business and what, which tactics have been successful for you? Uh, This is one of my favorite questions um, because there's so much that you can do nowadays online. Um, It's no longer that you have to always put yourself in a newspaper or in a television ad, Um, you know, cross collaboration with other people's audiences. You know, there's so many different creative campaigns that you can run without even having to pay any ads. So Hera's right in that there's so many organic ways uh, to build your, you know, online community. Um, but also if you have a retail space, those things work for, you know, any type of business, it's not limited to only online brands. Um, but the thing is that nowadays everyone does look to see someone's website or, you know, what people are saying about that company before they even go in and speak to anyone at the, at the business, uh, you know, word of mouth, uh, whether it's on your Facebook page, you know, or a link someone sent you is just as important nowadays as, you know, in-person referrals and stuff. So, um, you know, cross collaborations have been great. Finding other women in the community who are at the same stage as you would, will be willing to work with you. Um, and also putting on events, like they were lost for us, but it was a, you know, it was the whole purpose of it was to connect people and to get people aware of what we were doing online. Um, so it just depends on what kind of business you have and, you know, working with someone who um, is a professional in that space can help you with your strategy in terms of you know, marketing or whatever your goal is. Um, but, you know, it is true what Hera said that once you do something well, it does get around. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a natural momentum at play there. And so if you do one thing well, if you focus on either one product or one event or, you know, one creative campaign, um, it sort of opens more doors. And that usually helps uh, whether, whether it's a publication or, you know, uh, someone wanting to work with you somewhere. So a lot of it has been natural. I mean, I didn't really think, you know, the the day that I started, all those strategies are the same ones that I'm using today is really evolved over time. Uh, and also because the business has evolved over time and you just have to keep feeling it out, what people are responding to, what people are, you know, wanting more of, there's going to be some things that take off more than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's been really natural and organic, but you know, it just really depends on your goals and, you know, what your business type is. So like, 
you know, there's different strategies I use from different brands. Uh, from a Muslim nanny, it's a lot of more reaching out personally because it is, you know, uh, a company that's based on, on, on people babysitting um, or taking care of, you know, a family. Whereas something like, uh, you know, my global community at Slate Collective, like I can do that video chat, someone in Malaysia, and we've already built that relationship. Mm -hmm. So it depends. Or if it's like a home, it's my home decor line, you know, it's talking to people who have retail establishments who want to, you know, wholesale my products and stick them in their, in their stores, uh, whatever country they may be in. So it, it just really depends what you're trying to do um, and, you know, what your business is like. Uh, but it's so fun talking about strategies and maybe we can do like another workshop sometime. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I feel like there's so much information over here and it looks like we're kind of running out of time, but I want to keep going because there's so much to learn from you guys. Um, I would recommend everybody go and like the CIOGC page on Facebook and follow along to see how we can collaborate together or if you guys can join other workshops that we're hosting. Also, I want to say thank you to all the panelists. It's been an honor and a huge accomplishment to be sitting over here learning from all of you leaders today. I feel like there's so much information that we can take away and implement in our personal and our professional lives. So thank you guys so much. And one thing I do want to point out, whenever we do talk about Muslim women in business, I can't help but think about our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's wife, Khadija, who knew what she was doing business-wise. She made sure she did not compromise her modesty or integrity to succeed in a male-dominated field of trade. I ask that we don't stop here. We continue to collaborate. We get involved in the community and see how we can spread our knowledge and help each other and help the community in growing. So thank you guys so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to CIOG. Thank you. I'd like to just say one more thing while we're waiting for the transition. There is a Facebook group that CIOGC created for all of you guys to join. Uh, to keep in touch, it is a, it's called CIGC Women, and the link is posted in the chat. But we'll also send it out to all of you guys. Um, you know, some of you, we, we'll make sure that all the panelists are invited in, but also everyone who is in attendance today can join that, and um, it will it will be the same group for all the events that we do. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. This is Zahra. I'm uh, part of the Illinois Chamber of Commerce. Jazakumullahu khairan for an excellent event. MashaAllah, very inspiring. Uh, we get to learn from each other. Um, and uh, we value all your um, uh, experiences. Uh, we're looking forward for more of similar events, inshallah, in the future, uh, encouraging more women to step in and share their experiences with others. Before we conclude, I, I just want to take a moment here to thank everyone too. Um, on behalf of Council of Islamic Organization of Greater Chicago, I like to thank all the esteemed and the superstars that we had today, mashallah, it was so inspirational. Um, this was actually a kickstart of our weekly series in celebration of the Women's History Month, and it couldn't have been any better. It was such an inspirational session, not only for the women, but I would guess for the men attendees too. Um, and just like Zubina mentioned, I can't miss to reiterate about the mother of the believers, Khatija, and the first wife of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was not only a successful businesswoman in her own right, but also a Muslima with a strong faith, focus, and fortitude, which is pretty much the theme of our weekly series that we are doing in this month of uh, Women History Month. With that, I like to thank uh, Zubina the, for being such a great moderator for today. Mashallah, you did a wonderful job. I also want to take a moment to thank Sahira Sadek, who is a board member of CIOGC, 
for spearheading this series of event in recognition of this month of the Women History Month. And not the last but not the least, Ikra Azhar, who was also a panelist here today, but also helped behind the scene to make this event such a successful event. And two more people that I can't miss to thank is Sister Sumaya Rahman, who was uh, helping us with the intros during this whole thing. And also behind the scenes, she helped us with the moving parts of this to make this event successful. And so did Sana, Rash Sana Rashid. So Jazakallah khair for all these great inspirational women on the panel, the attendees, and all the people who made this event such a successful event. I do want to tell you that next week, same time at 2 o'clock, we have a second session in recognition of this month. That session is Women Leaders in Places of Worship, and it would be March 14th, Sunday at 2 o'clock Central Time. So please do plan to join. Inshallah, we would love to have you all over there, including the panelists and the attendees today. Please pass on the word. We would love to have you all again the following Sunday at 2 o'clock. Jazakallah khair, everyone. Assalamu alaikum for joining. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you so much for joining. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, also, thank you for allowing the Arab American Business and Professional Association for co-sponsoring this event. It's been very, very inspirational. I hope this is just the beginning of a long relationship with CIOG. Um, and again, very inspirational. I, uh, I can't tell you enough what a privilege it was to join you all. Congratulations, sisters. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you for being one of the sponsors here. Jazakallah khair. Thank you.